Hello and welcome back everyone. It's so good to see you. I feel like it's been a while. Happy New Year. Happy other side of January. Um, I'm so excited for us to be in space together. Um, just a heads up that uh, if you haven't already uh, changed your um, name to include your pronouns, we would love to do that to be sure that we are addressing you in the correct manner. And you can do that by simply right clicking on your name and updating your name um, on Zoom. Um, this is not only a new year and our first time gathering of this new year, um, but we also have some new team members here today that we're really excited um, to include. Um, one of those you will meet shortly, Yvonne, uh, who is bringing with us a wealth of wisdom. Some of you have already worked with Yvonne in your individual check-ins. And another person who you may not see, but is one of the reasons why we are able to show up today is Benita, and she is working in the the background as our operations specialist and being sure that we're able to be in this virtual space today. So just wanted to say welcome everybody and welcome to our new team members. We're going to go ahead and jump in. We have some really exciting information to share with you all today around an introduction to mental health first aid in a community conversation. So yeah, go for it. Let's move on to the agenda. So we're going to do spend a little bit of time doing some check in today, uh, go over some uh, program progress, how we're doing as a cohort, talk a little bit about National Mentoring Month and the Mentoring Summit, and then we're going to do an introduction to mental health first aid, a community conversation, uh, which is twofold and it, it's the content and the conversation that we're having today and it's also a tool that you will be able to take back and use yourselves in your own community. Before we jump into everything, uh, it's great to meet all of you, uh, to re-meet and re-see uh, some of you. My name's Ivan. My preferred pronouns are him and él. Um, and I'm going to invite us to check in with each other. We know that we come from meetings, from strategy conversations, and just from being alive in 2022. Uh, so having an opportunity to just check in with each other uh, can really help us just settle into the conversation today. And we're going to go into random groups of three, invite you to introduce yourself and share if you had an unexpected free day, what would you like to do? Knowing that a lot of these unexpected free days don't come by very often. Um, we also want to be mindful that some of you might have had too many Zoom meetings this week. So if you're not feeling this little check-in, there is an option to go into a, into a room with the mic off, with the camera off for the amount of time that we're doing this brief little check-in. So if you want to be in this silent room, please send a direct message using the Zoom chat to Benita. She will sort you into the quiet room. We're going to be in this breakout just for about four minutes. Uh, so a little bit over a minute for each of you who go into this uh, check-in. Again, just name, preferred pronouns, anything else that you feel relevant to share, your role, your team. And then this prompt, if you had an unexpected free day, what would you like to do? Um, and so uh, again, if you would like to be in that quiet room, please feel free to send a message to Benita. Uh, otherwise, you will just go into a random room and get to meet other folks and check in with other folks here on the call. So without further ado, actually, before we do any questions. Hearing none, if we are ready, um, we'll go ahead and go do this, this little checkout or little check in in our breakouts. For the folks that are coming in, we're doing a quick little check-in. Uh, there's uh, a random assignment to these little check-in groups. If you could just please share your name, preferred pronouns, anything else that you feel is relevant, and uh, share. If you had an unexpected free day, what would you like to do? If you would much rather step back from this check-in, feel free to send a message to Benita, and you will go into a quiet room with mic off and camera off. Okay.
there are geese flying nearby, so I'm going to put myself on mute for a second. Joey, if you had an expected free day, what would you do? Oh, you're still muted. 24 full hours of whatever I want. I would paint. I would watch Tiny Desk or I would go to a concert. Um, uh, and I would have charcuterie all day. Mm. <laughs> the one available at your party? Highlight highlight of my <laughs> just my experience it, it's, it was so great sounds oh. wholesome so wholesome uh, how, we, how about you um I would go to either uh, a hike in mountains or I would find a place near the ocean and just read I'll just have some good food mm -hmm. probably some drinks and just read I could read. Oh my gosh. That is usually what I do in the, my power nap by resting is sit on the couch and just read a chapter of something. Mm -hmm. It brings me back. How about you, Benita? What would you do with a free day? Mm, I definitely would go to the beach. The beach is my happy place and just relax and sip on a margarita and <laughs> eat some great snacks <laughs> yes I left the champagne out of my day but know that it would definitely be yeah. <laughs> uh, for painting joy what uh painting medium would you use I love canvas and oil paint but I and I also like the charcoal um in the pencils and all that and erasers I I don't know how to use like the, the that good I think it's rich paint mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's because I was a poor art student charcoal and I get along really well and mm -hmm. we 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 have fun we get messy it's fun good times yeah yeah I know I'm not good at it I just think it's fun <laughs> it is you get a lot done with very little effort with pencil and graphite it's just a lot mm -hmm. of blending with chalk is just not chalk with charcoal it's like whoop, done yeah. entire yeah. section is shaded Yes, I like that about charcoal. <laughs> How are we doing with time, Benita? We have about two minutes left. Okay. And I just sent a message to the group because I had pre-created um, the breakout rooms. And then I realized I needed to make a, oh, someone's joining here. So I don't know if you want to speak to them. No, I lost her. On my end, it's showing that she's still joining. So um, it may be a slow connection. Okay. So she can just hang out with us here. I love that people took the opportunity for a quiet room. Yes, yes. And so I just um, hit the close all rooms because it's a 60 second countdown. Um, but the next one, I'm going to automatically have it set up since everyone is in the room now and I have a better sense of the numbers to equally distribute the rooms. Thank you. The Zoom close always makes me feel very anxious. Like, oh, we have 30 seconds. We have 30 seconds. Or seeing a count and be like, all right, we're doing it in time. And then you have another 60 seconds. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, welcome back. Welcome back. We're going to keep uh, giving folks a, a few more seconds until we're all back in the same room. It doesn't feel right to say we're in the same room, but in the <laughs> same screen.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you got to uh, refresh your memory on the uh, about the folks who are uh, part of this cohort alongside you, and that you got to get some good ideas of random things to do if you have an unexpected free day. Um, I would share that for me, it would be a day by the beach with some good drinks and a good book. Um, hopefully, each of you was able to share something that felt good for you. Um, but without uh, stretching this out any further, we're going to keep uh, hitting the ground running. And we're going to move on to our uh, progress update. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, so overall, in terms of our match goal, we are at about 54% of our overall cohort match goal and 59% of our pre-match training. Um, what I know about this is that pre-match training numbers are actually quite higher than this. Um, and so what I'm asking for you all is a little bit more um, effort in terms of getting your pre-batch training logged in IMS, because I know for sure that you all are doing training and orientation and interviews before you're being, before you're matching. Uh, so we just ask that you spend a little bit more effort and energy adding that information to, to IMS so that we can share that story too of all the work that you are doing. I wanna give a kudos and shout out to a couple of programs who are at nearly 100% of pre-match training of adding that at IMS. And that is LIFT, uh, Longview and Children's Home Society of West Virginia and Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, Southern Arizona. So huge kudos to you all in getting those trainings in. A huge um, thank you and kudos to all of the programs because we are doing great on mentor retention. All of the programs are at 95% are better on retaining your mentors. So while we are, it's been a tough couple of years to um, get new mentors in, once they're in, they stay and they are committed and they um, and a lot of times are feeling supported. So shout out to all of us for that. An area that you probably are tired of hearing us talk about, but I'm still going to ask you to um, try to do a better job of putting in the IMS is around resources. So a lot of you have become a hub in your communities for families and youth um, in terms of sharing those resources out, whether that is in case management and a newsletter or other ways. But I know that you all are getting the resources out there. So we'd love to see higher numbers in IMS. But also um, it's really no, it's loading, uh, noting low uh, numbers in terms of people accessing resources. And I happen to know from TA that a lot of your folks are accessing the resources that you provide to them or send out to them. So we would love to see a little bit more data in, in IMS, especially as we near the end of the grant cycle, because it has been such a taxing time for youth and families, for all of us, we want to be able to show the efforts that you all have made in providing access to resources in to the community for your family. So please, if you could um, help with that, that would be awesome. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the last month. So last month was National Mentoring Month. It was um, National Prevention and Trafficking Month. It was also National Reporting Month. So thank you to all of you who got all of that data in on time that we were able to um, share information with OJJDP and submit those reports. Um, but we wanted to give an opportunity for you all to share with us some of the lessons from the National Mentoring Summit. What were some of the takeaways or suggestions uh, that you have for mentoring programs or others in the youth services field? And then National Mentoring Month, what stood out? There's some of us that we kind of do the same thing every year. Uh, and I also noticed some innovations this year. So I'd love to hear from you all uh, some reflections. And if you would go on to click on that link, Yvonne is gonna walk us through uh, how to share, how we're gonna share this information. And part of this debrief is acknowledging your expertise and your experience. Uh, there is a lot of experts who stand and share information. And then there's the practitioners who put that information into practice. And there's a lot of knowledge uh, that is very valuable there. So that, that's why we're uh, inviting you to, to help us populate this virtual wall so that we can share amongst ourselves those promising practices, those points of growth. Uh, and that's where Padlet Kick comes in. So you see these two prompts here. Uh, you're welcome to contribute to both. You can simply add uh, just by clicking on the plus sign, you can add a subject 
uh, of which is Youth Collab. And you have the option to upload files. You can just click it here. So if there's a good toolkit or a resource, you can upload the file. If there is a link, you can uh, directly enter it here. So youthcollaboratory.org. You can add uh, videos if there's a good TED talk that you came across, you can add it here, publish, and it will automatically be added here. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you about four minutes to uh, contribute to this wall, uh, to, to whatever it is that you want to share. And we will also be sharing everything that you put here in a follow-up email so that all of us have access to everything that we posted here. Um, so we're going to go about uh, four minutes, uh, maybe a little bit less, uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, but go ahead uh, and jump on this virtual wall and start adding things as soon as you're ready. Take about 30 seconds to start wrapping up your thoughts. So much. I see a couple of you are still uh, typing in. So feel free to continue contributing to this throughout the day. If it's too distracting, uh, I would encourage you to uh, return to this after. Um, we will be exporting everything that you shared here and se sending it along with the follow up email so that you could also take some time to look at uh, what we come up here as a group and be able to reflect that with the work and what that looks like in your own with your own team and your own community. Uh, but it really seems like there is time to just take a step back 
to recognize the work internally, recognize mentors for the work that they have been doing, uh, expressing that gratitude there. Um, so uh, just high-fiving that virtually, being able to slow down in a work during time, that just feels like we're always having uh, to, to stay one step behind. Um, so kudos to all of you for the work that, that you have been doing this past month. Um, and uh, thank you for, for debriefing the work that you and your teams have done uh, starting this this year. With that, we're going to transition into uh, mental health, talking about mental health. As we've been checking in with you uh, in this past month, we have noticed a trend that these conversations are starting to be more and more relevant in our communities. Not that they haven't been in the past, but we are just starting to see specific situations, crises might be coming up in a way that maybe we haven't seen before. And I want us to start talking about this in how many of us, both staff and volunteers, have a genuine desire to help. Uh, there's a lot of good intention whenever we hear that a young person or a parent or a mentor is struggling. Uh, but genuinely, we also know that there's just a lot of information out there that could easily be overwhelming. So I'm wondering if in the chat, you could please just enter what do you think are the most common mental health diagnoses in the US? So as we're thinking about mental health, honing into those diagnoses, thinking about mental illness specifically, what are the four most common diagnoses uh, or that, that we think are the most common? Anxiety and depression, depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a very sad statistic or not sad, but important statistic is that pre-pandemic, it was about one in three adults qualified for the diagnoses. Uh, sorry, it was one in 10 adults qualified for the diag diagnoses of depression. Now it's one in three. Um, so when we're thinking of just adults specifically, uh, that's going up a lot. And if that's an indication of the well-being of young people, we can only imagine what that could look like. I see generalized anxiety, ADHD, post-traumatic stress, bipolar disorder, so I've asked this question a lot in the last several years. And interestingly, the same four um, are almost always up there. This is one of the first exceptions where schizophrenia has not been mentioned. Uh, but we know that depression and anxiety are often mentioned as the most common. Uh, and then we also know bipolar and schizophrenia, both of these diagnoses often uh, with a lot of misinformation and confusion. Misinformation is not the right word, but lack of appropriate information for, for a lot of the communities we serve. Um, the, the important thing that I would want to mention here is that each of these diagnoses is complicated, is very individual, uh, and there is a lot of information out there for each diagnosis. And so if someone was to go on Google, if you have an interaction with a young person and they bring up that they might be having uh, symptoms of depression or they've been feeling very anxious, and if we tell them, you know what, let's look for good information. It turns out that if you just search these words online together, you have over a billion search results. And there are some research that shows that our brain starts becoming overwhelmed with information with anything more than three options. And so if we just think that we become overwhelmed with anything above three, any list of three, and we have over a billion search results out here available, uh, it makes a lot of sense why some people prefer not to talk about it. Because we have so much information that talking about it means that I'm just going to be bombarded with statistics, with diagnoses, with uh, things of how I can be better. And that is where this community conversation steps in. The goal is not necessarily to give individuals a uh, connection to, to a diagnosis or medical treatment. The idea is that we know that uh, a lot of good can come out of conversations where people can non-judgmentally share their ideas, expectations, and experiences related to their own mental health. And that's where a community conversation steps in. Uh, we have, I have facilitated this model across uh, different communities in English and Spanish. Um, it's been used across the United States for a couple of years now, and a community conversation really focuses on four specific outcomes. One is just building community. We know that building community for community's sake can have very positive outcomes for a lot of folks. The second is to explore language talked, uh, explore the language that we use to talk about mental health topic because we don't have a lot of shared language. We talk about mental health a lot. We know it's conversations that come up, uh, but we still don't have a lot of shared 
shared language. So this model gives a community shared language to talk about mental health. Uh, the third is to explore common misconceptions related to mental uh, health. And the last one is to introduce the formal mental health first aid course, which is an eight hour certification course, which I know some of you have already uh, participated in and are certified mental health first aid uh, first aiders. Uh, in the follow up email that goes along with this recording, you will receive uh, sample PowerPoint slides, which are those blue ones on your screen, and you will also receive the facilitation guide so that you could take this conversation to your own community and adapt it to your staff, young people, parents, volunteers, or all of the above. This is not uh, an expectation that you are an expert in mental health at all because the purpose is this conversation, not necessarily to provide diagnoses, not to provide treatment, is to have a space where individuals can talk about this. Um, so what are you gonna need if, if this is something that you want to take back to your community? So materials, uh, projector, and a computer. There's a lot of folks that benefit from having visual cues, uh, but it is 100% not required. If you would much rather have this in a circle at a park somewhere, that can totally work. Um, but if you do have that projector and a computer, you can use those slides that, that we are providing or you can adapt them to your own. Uh, large post-it pads and whiteboard, ideally for some of the brainstorming sessions, of course, markers, true false indicators for a myth busting activity and any printed shareable resources that are relevant to your community, whether it's crisis line numbers, free mental health services. This is the perfect time at the end of a conversation to give those kind of resources away. This is the breakdown on the right-hand side of your screen of what this could look like. It's about 60 to 90 minutes. It can be adapted to fit the needs of, of your group, of your community. Uh, for our purposes today, we're only going to be focusing on a small portion of the, the, this conversation. But I am going to ask that we engage in this conversation as a cohort for two reasons. One, what is our own shared language as a cohort around mental health? What is our own understanding and misconceptions? So, so that we can engage with it at that level. But number two is that you can also get some insight into the facilitation of this conversation so that you can take it back to your community and start thinking of what could this look like? What, already, what is already good to start uh, facilitating? What adaptations do I need to make? Um, so I'm gonna pause for any questions or point for clarification before we, we continue. Any questions? All right, hearing none, I'll pass it over to Joy. Thank you, Yvonne. And so I also want to just let us know that for those of us who have been doing ongoing training for almost two years or more now, our pre-match training, and we need a, some an extra something to provide, this is a good option. Um, you can use this face-to-face -face, uh, or you can use it virtually, uh, but just know that this is a resource for you that can count towards your either pre-match training or ongoing trainings that you're able to facilitate with your folks. So as we prepare to uh, have conversations around mental health, we want to be sure that we are centering some space agreements and how we go about having this conversation. So the first is to always honor privacy. Um, these conversations can lend themselves to people sharing stories, um, personal stories, and people may become vulnerable. So one of the ways that you may hear this in group agreements is to um, learning leaves the room, but the stories stay. So we want to uh, encourage you to to avoid using any identifying details or any personal details, but allow the learning to leave the room. Uh, take space and make space. There are those of us like myself who has a lot to say most times. And I have to sometimes write down on a notepad next to me my thoughts. So I allow other people um, space in the conversation as well. On the other side of that, there are those of us who have lots of wisdom to share. And oftentimes we don't hear your voices in these spaces. So I encourage you to um, take up some space, a little bit more space than you might um, in other places because we're specifically uh, saying we want to hear from you and woman we want to make space from you um, we want to always assume good intent which is that to not assume that someone uh, is going out of the way to maybe be disrespectful but understanding that we're all coming to this with different life experiences different levels of expertise and that is good we all bring something to the table even if it's just an appetite but on the other side of assuming good intent is to be accountable when we cause harm and notice if like oh okay maybe Maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe that was received in a different way that I meant it, then to um, be accountable to that and, um, and apologize where needed. 
And that final one is to take care of yourself. Um, some of this content can be heavy. So this is also a place where we will give a content warning for sensitive topics, where we will be including uh, topics of psychosis, self-harm, and suicide. So if any of this is too much for you at any point, please care for yourself in a way that is most suitable to you. Uh, and we respect and encourage that virtually in the same way we would as if we were in a physical room together. Uh, so part of what we want to do and normalize, and we would like for you all to normalize when you're having this training, is to build consensus around these space agreements. So I would love for you, if you are in full agreement of uh, maintaining these space agreements, to use your reaction button in Zoom to give a thumbs up. If you are not in agreement, please give a thumbs down. Uh, we want to be sure that we can get to a, a space of agreement on how we're going to keep um, and sustain safe space in this uh, room. All right, I'm seeing quite a few thumbs up. Um, I have not seen any thumbs down, but if you put, I did not see it, please uh, do it again and we will be sure to pause to be sure we're on, on the same page and aligned. All right. All right, thank you for that. It looks like we're in agreement about how we're going to maintain um, space uh, for this conversation. And we can go ahead and get started. So when we're talking about mental health, there are, it's important to recognize the different dimensions of mental health and that they are often used interchangeably when in fact um, they, they're, they're not all the same. Uh, and there are specific, uh, specifically three different dimensions, and we want to be intentional about how we're using it, each of them. So when we're thinking about mental health, we're thinking about a state, and using that term, it's a state of mental health. Sometimes people refer to mental health um, in a way that would make you assume that it's talking about poor mental health experiences, uh, when it really is a spectrum of mental wellness. Uh, so that could include um, peak mental health and then it can include in declining mental health, it's the spectrum of mental health and it shouldn't be used as a way to refer to um, poor, quote unquote, poor mental health, right? And when we think about mental health disorder, um, usually the way that I remember to, and in terms of how to refer to a disorder, is it's something that was diagnosed by someone who has a lot of student loans and a lot of letters behind their name, right? Like, it's not up to me to be like, oh my gosh, they're being bipolar today, or that is bipolar. Like, that is completely out of line with um, my role, um, you know, in this work. And so uh, mental health disorder is something that is diagnosable right, or something that has been diagnosed by someone who has the skills to do the diagnosing. It's not, um, for those of us without that skill to do that diagnosing, um, also when we think about mental health disorders, we're thinking about the impact on somebody's ability to live, love, laugh, learn, and their interactions with law enforcement. And uh, just a little bit on these um, four to five L's, um, when we say the impacting somebody's ability to live, uh, are they impacted by suicidal thoughts or behaviors? Um, are there behaviors that they're doing that impact their health and well-being? In terms of their impact to love, does it impact their relationships and their ability to stay in satisfying and be in with satisfying relationships, um, receive love and things of that nature and feel like they can contribute value? Uh, laugh, does it impact their daily uh, encounters with joy? Not my self joy, but happiness joy, right? Does it impact their overall happiness? Their, their ability to learn or go to work? So does it impact their ability to show up and go to school with minimal interruption, learn from their mistakes or maintain a job? And this last one, impact their ability to engage with law enforcement. Unfortunately, we've seen many publicized stories of people with mental health challenges who have definitely been negatively impacted by engaging with law enforcement because of perception of their, them being dangerous when in fact they may not be. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a mental health disorder is that it's diagnosable or that it's, it impacts deeply someone's four to five L's. 
When we're thinking about a mental health problem, it's in reference to someone experiencing a level of interruption that may come across in those four to five L's, but it hasn't been diagnosed. For instance, grief or trauma. So you may be going through a situational grief that has made it very difficult for to show up to work and very difficult to be in relationship, but that is a natural part of the grieving process and that wouldn't necessarily be a mental health challenge or a mental health problem. So we just want to be really mindful and intentional about how we're utilizing um, mental health challenge, mental, mental health disorders or illness, our mental health problems and challenges. So we're going to be very mindful in how we use these for the rest of our time together and also beyond. If we ever speak about these topics again with you moving forward, if we talk about mental health, we're not talking about poor mental health. We're talking about the entire spectrum of it. Same thing for, for these other words. This is our, our shared language that we're encouraging all of us to, to start thinking about. Um, but we also know that a lot of this shared language comes from our own personal experiences, our cultural background, the connections that we had growing up. So we're going to go into small groups in order to explore these. Um, again, I encourage you to engage with this both as participant and possible future facilitator of these conversations. So consider what these conversations might sound like in your own uh, community, but encouraging you to, to, to participate and engage with these um, as a participant, reflecting on your, on your own lived experience. We're gonna go into breakouts of four. The questions are now in the chat. I encourage you to copy and paste them somewhere else so that they, they don't get lost in the chat. There is no option of a silent room for this one, but there's always the option to pass. So if you're uh, not feeling like you want to contribute to this discussion, that's perfectly fine. Just encourage you to listen uh, actively and then we'll come back and do a brief share out. Uh, but just to read them out loud before you go into the group, when and how did you first learn about mental illness? What kind of attitudes towards mental health exist in the environments where you work and live? And how do these impact the way that you discuss your own mental health challenges? And finally, are there any mental health topics that you wish you knew more about? If so, what are they? I'm going to ask about two of you to report back when we, we come back. So there's no need to select a, a, a lead person to report back, uh, but I will be asking a couple of you to, to, uh, to share. Uh, once you're ready, feel free to join your room and we'll see you in, in several minutes. Okay, I'm gonna um, go into the rooms really quickly and drop the questions again. Thank you, Benita. Do you remember when you first learned about mental, mental illness, Joy? You're muted. Thank you. Um, as a child um, and I don't think it was, he was like a godfather to my uh, mom. And now like, now I know it was Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so that was like my first indication, like, oh, something is wrong with God daddy. And there was so much love and understanding and acceptance around him that I was like, okay, that's, there's something going on. But I, that was, I didn't know that it was mental illness, but I knew that something wasn't like he wasn't present is what it felt like. Yeah, yeah. And you say you said it was Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, very similar experience. Very, mm -hmm. very similar experience with my great grandma, uh, my visa. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was interesting from, from what I remember is that it was also never acknowledged as mental illness, but mm -hmm. there was always just heaviness around it. When we would mm -hmm. go visit her, when we would leave uh, and we would depart from, from the place where she was staying. Um, mm -hmm. There was just a lot of heaviness, fear, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of tears, but yeah. never directly acknowledged. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I think after that, maybe like middle school, and it was like, oh, okay, now we're separating people. Um, there is a clear like them over there type of vibe going on in the school. Yeah. 
I hadn't reflected on this question in quite some time. And now I'm having a lot of early in life memories come in of uh, also trauma, going back to like the the, the role of trauma. Um, mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is like generational trauma. I remember mm -hmm. stories of, of both my parents talking about the experiences that they had because of the experiences their parents had and just clicking right now, how that it also is talking about mental health without talking about mental health. Yes. Yeah. The experience of coming of age in America generally mm -hmm. includes some type of trauma or impact from um, that generational past. Yeah. There was this war uh, that my great grandparents participated in. It was a, a form of a civil war, um, mm -hmm. La Guerra de los Cristeros. It was mm -hmm. uh, around, it was Christian folk battling the state. My family mm -hmm. was part of the Cristeros, um, mm -hmm. which is a huge, weird thing to, to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, but my dad has a lot of stories of hiding in the middle of that war and like having to duck and cover in wells. It's, yeah. That's so well. I've read a book about that in college. It is the silliest war in Mexican mm -hmm. history. And th of course, that's an opinion. I, like mm -hmm. folks get to fight for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's to this day known or perceived as one of the most weird wars that have happened in Mexican history. Um, yeah. Interesting. What would you say in terms of like, are, are the attitudes towards mental health that exist in the environments where you work or live? Like now with the um, information that you have, I don't know if that's a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's weird because I think it's extreme opposites. I think with our team here in Youth Collab, there's a lot of mindfulness and sensitivity to it, but, and, and in a way that it feels unusual. Um, it, there, there's a lot of focus and mindfulness outside of it, at least here in East Oakland, it feels like we're blind to it. It's like, we all see it, but mm -hmm. we don't see them. We see individuals who might be struggling. Mm -hmm. um, we might see our own neighbors, but, but that, that's as far as it goes. We continue yeah. with life as usual. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a weird contrast. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like I would think, I, I think in the community, like there is, I always think of it in terms of the communities that I've been like have been central to my life that there's a level of acceptance and understanding like something is going on with them, um, you know, and to kind of watch out for them and don't let anything happen to them. But there isn't like a deep understanding beyond that, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. I think of the East Oakland Collective here, who's very much about let's feed them, let's house them, let's clothe them, let's mm -hmm. take care of each other because it's not them, it's us. And I, right. I, I see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it feels like the exception. I don't, I don't. Yeah. It feels but like that, the exception. And, that, and that's what I'm saying is that I think it's not fair because I think I have experienced a lot of the ex exception so much so that when I'm in environments and that's not the case, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what is this? Yeah. Are there any topics you wish you would knew more about? Knowing that you're a former mental health first aid instructor. <laughs> um, you know, I think I can't help but to think of Nina and her work on um, compassion fatigue mm -hmm. for specifically for um, youth serving professionals. Uh, in working with youth and communities who have been impacted by trauma. Let's let's pin and come back to that conversation. Okay, I'm going to pin it. <laughs> I, several years ago, I got a compassion fatigue workbook mm -hmm. that, is, that is intentionally about bringing just colleagues together to be able to support each other in, through compassion fatigue. Um, but yeah, I definitely don't know enough to be able to yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like a good one for our cafeteria. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm like very respectfully fascinated by schizophrenia. And mm -hmm. so I think I know more than a quote unquote average person about mm -hmm. schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, but I specifically would want to know about different cultural ways that people with schizophrenia are able to live a full life, knowing that 
like pre-colonialism and outside of the Western region, folks mm -hmm. who live with schizophrenia are often actually respected uh, for their experiences and are seen as wise, as being able to tap into wisdoms that many others don't. And mm -hmm. it's very cultural. So, but that, that's kind of what I would like to lean into. Like how do other parts of the world and other histories uh, support people with that lived experience? Well, I don't know about other parts of the world. I, I've heard about it, but I do have someone locally who talks about dual identity um, mm. in a way that is very um, different than what we've read. Yeah, yeah. There's a an incredible collection of, of books called uh, Collective Schizophrenia and is mm -hmm. the experience of an Asian American woman from the Bay Area mm -hmm. who lives with schizophrenia, schizophrenia mm -hmm. diagnosis, yeah. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that conversation uh, what was you were able to breathe through it. Um, and I'd like to hear a couple of, of uh, just reflections back. So if, if I could ask one person to just go off mute, no need to raise your hand. Uh, and if you could just briefly share, when and how did you first learn about mental illness or mental health? Um, I will go. Um, with our group, it was kind of unanimous that we really couldn't pinpoint a time because we have, we have family members that suffer with mental illness. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, it was just known um, from having it within our own families. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I, I would say that, that that is a common thread, that it's always been there. Whether we talk about it directly or not, that's a different story. But many of us do know individuals that have been living with uh, mental health challenges or mental illness for a really long time. It's not something that most of us were exposed to this past two years. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the kind of attitudes that you find in the environments where you work and live, what do you notice? What are the type of attitudes? And no oh. pressure for you to continue, Trinell, but. Oh, is that for me to continue? I was gonna say, oh. no, no pressure. Oh, oh, I saw Megan okay. was gonna okay. answer. <laughs> yeah, um, so in Wyoming, we, it's a mental health crisis in our state. We have the highest suicide rate in the nation. Um, and as a state, we really don't talk about mental health as a whole, piece, like as a part of an individual self, you know, the healthy part of mental health as well as the crisis situations. We just tend to um, look at more of the interventions instead of the preventions of the state when it comes to mental health. Yeah, and I would say just by, by a show of hands for those of you that are off camera, how many of you would say that's similar in your own regions that you don't talk about it, but it's definitely part of the conversations, but you don't, don't address it preventatively or directly? I see some, some thumbs up. I would say that that's the case for many of us, uh, still out of, uh, out of the fear and the stigma that could mean around bringing this to our communities. But just to notice the, the stark difference that many of us know about mental illness from our own lived experience from a very young age, but we still don't have a lot of structural formal supports um, from, from, our, from just our own communities. And so there's a really interesting contradiction there that is worth just voicing being able to let people know like, yeah, what we're experiencing is real. Even if there's no collective language around this, which is part of why this conversation is, uh, exists and we encourage you to bring it to your communities, but knowing that it's there and many of us can speak from firsthand experience. Um, and just to, to, to the last question, what type of information or what other mental health topics do you wish you knew more about? Feel free to put this in the chat um, or also go off mic. Uh, what, what would you like to know more about? related to mental health? Um, I would like to um, learn more about um, methods that, you know, low, low, low cost methods um, to identify as well as to treat um, and manage um, with clients who don't have access to, you know, the ability to go to a doctor and get a medication. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're working with children, what can, what can we teach them? You know, something small is just tapping in breath work. So being able to find those strategies that uh, are effective, that folks don't need to jump through a lot of hoops or a lot of paperwork or an mm -hmm. entire insurance file in order to, to receive 
to receive that. Absolutely. Anything else? I would like to uh, talk a little bit about kind of like the last question kind of like mixed with this one a little bit <clears throat> but if that environment around you uh, and the thirst of like knowing more I feel unconsciously it built at least at Boulder Options and our staff when we took the mental health first aid, first aid training it helped us unconsciously it opened us to be more aware of like mental health challenges in general but also to open up about our own mental health challenges. So that's something we, we did unconsciously just because we were more aware, we were looking for more training around it. And I feel that it's the topic, kind of like the, the goal, it's like how we can create those environments consciously yeah. uh, around our community. Yeah, and a point that, th thank you for, for sharing that. And uh, one, one of the things that I'll share from what, highlight from what you just shared is that a lot of this also has to happen internally. It's not things that we just can bring up and do to other people who are experiencing those challenges, those conditions over there, that many times it's also internally. A lot of practices and skills that we would benefit from ourselves. Um, going back to how mental illness and mental health challenges are not the same, I would say a good amount of us in this call probably qualify for a diagnosis, but even more are experiencing a mental health challenge. Uh, the last two years is enough to uh, put a lot of us in a situation of high levels of stress, uh, changing our, our own appetite, our quality of sleep. Um, and so recognizing that it's something that also happens internally. Um, so thank you for, for also uh, contextualizing that. Um, knowing that this conversation, oh, sorry, I see you went off mic, Joy. Oh, I just wanted to lift up Megan's comment in the chat too. Um, the, you're saying how to help our mentors be more informed and able to assist, not as mental health professionals, but as someone who can be there before it does become a crisis. That's a perfect segue on how a lot of wanting to, to, to know how to do all, all of this, how to support folks. Uh, we sometimes do think that we ourselves need a PhD or those fancy letters after our email signature. Uh, but there is a lot of a lot of power, a lot of uh, transformational potential, a lot of healing from just good information. When we're not contributing to myths, when we're not building on the taboo and the stigma of mental illness. So we're now going to spend a little bit of time working through some common misconceptions. You see the Loch Ness Monster on your screen. Not that there's a Loch Ness Monster of mental illness, but we do know that there's a lot of uh, common misconceptions of some good information that it's used in the wrong context. So what we're going to do is we're going to read a statement. We're going to read, read a phrase. I'm also gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, we're going to, to read a statement and in the chat, I'm going to ask that you just put if you think it's true or if you think it's false. Some of these statements are complicated. So if you think it's a little bit of both, feel free to also put a true, false or an in-between, but try to answer just one of those three, true, false, or in-between. Uh, we're gonna get started with the first statement just to do as a trial run and also get us started. So true or false, mental illnesses are permanent. Again, true or false, mental illness or mental uh, uh, health diagnoses are permanent. I see a false come in, false, false. True, I see a true false, uh, uh, great. Okay, so I see a lot of overwhelming false. For our purposes, this is a false. The reason we say this is a false is because there is an assumption that if someone receives a diagnosis of depression, that they will be the depressed person for the rest of their life. Or if they receive a diagnosis of anxiety, that they are the anxious one for the rest of their life. And what we really want to start normalizing is that recovery is absolutely 100% possible regardless of the diagnoses. Some diagnoses make it a little bit more challenging with a lot of more added supports, but regardless of the diagnoses, whether it's a serious mental illness or a common mental illness, uh, you can recover and you can live those four to five L's. Um, and so that, that's uh, kind of how we're starting this activity, acknowledging that most mental illnesses can be connected to a sense of recovery. Absolutely. And the next one is mental illnesses are genetically predetermined. 
true or false or somewhere in between. I'm seeing false, true, false, true, false, false, false. Mm -hmm. Lots of false. Just 15 more seconds and false. Mm -hmm. So this is one when, that's in between, right? There are some things that are not preventable, but we can lessen the impact of mental illness on our lives or on the lives of our loved ones. Um, it's important to understand that no mental illness is strictly genetic or environmental. It is usually a combination of the both. So some folks do have a higher genetic, some illnesses do have a higher gen genetic component, uh, but individuals also have the ability to recover and to lessen that impact. And we want to be sure that we're not putting people again in that box of always, um, like you have this, and this is something that is genetically tied to you all the time. We want to be careful of diagnosing in that way. For the next statement, uh, true or false? People with mental illness are violent. Mm. Again, true or false, people with mental illness are violent. So I see a lot of falses coming in. False, false. Are we going to go unanimous this whole time? Does anyone want to do a, the in-between? Oh, sometimes. sometimes. Thank mm. you, Janess. Uh, sometimes. Uh, true, false. Hafit, the true, false can be tough. Yes, absolutely. So we do know, uh, just observationally, if most of us in our workplace, in our neighborhood, out at the park, if we saw someone displaying signs and symptoms of mental illness, more often than not, the response is to call 911 because we're afraid of our safety. We want to include uh, individuals that will keep us safe. And so there is an underlying assumption that people with mental illness are somehow a threat, are somehow violent. And as those of you that said, sometimes there's an increased predisposition for aggression, not necessarily violence. Um, so before I talk about the difference between aggression and violence, some key things to talk about. Uh, people with mental illness, instead of being perpetrators of violence, they're actually three times more likely to be victims of violence. Uh, so really thinking that the tables are actually a bit turned. People with mental illness are more likely to be victims than perpetrators of, of violence. Uh, and many times if they do perpetrate violence, it's against themselves. For example, self-harm or certain forms of addiction. Uh, we also know that a person is just as likely to kill someone or to be violent in that way as they are to be struck by lightning, which is about one in 10 million, which is to say that individuals who are mentally ill are not very likely to, to just go off on this killing spree, which is usually the image that, that we have in the back of our cultural mind. Um, and so it's important to understand the difference between aggression and violence. Uh, just real briefly, does anyone wanna speak into the difference between aggression and violence? So aggression happens when there is an overwhelm of, of emotion that needs to come up and out. I am angry. I am flustered. I'm annoyed. So I might start yelling. I might start shoving things out of the way. But that's because that's so emotion, so much emotion that I cannot contain. And I just need to externalize it. That's aggression. Violence is targeted and intentional. So the key difference that, that we might be able to say is if we were all in the same room and I become aggressive, I might grab this potted plant and throw it across the room because I'm angry, I'm frustrated, and I throw it against the room. And that's part of externalizing my aggression. Similar could be violence if somewhere else were in the room with me, I grab the potted plant and I throw it at them because I want to hurt them. That's violence. So as we're thinking about mental illness and reducing the stigma and the weight that we have around these topics uh, is really understanding that folks can be aggressive and they're likely to be aggressive, which means they respond best to de-escalation rather than violence um, or rather than responding to violence. Um, this is the one time uh, that I am very clear that if someone is behaving violently, this is perhaps the only time that I would say this is time to call 911 um, because it's, it's when we bring in folks that have training to keep people safe. Uh, but it is very, very unusual and very unlikely. If folks are behaving aggressive, aggressively, then the response should be to bring in folks trained in de-escalation. Uh, just for the sake of, of being thorough, 
Unfortunately, the police are not fully trained in de-escalation. Out of a, um, some research, it shows that uh, individuals who go through police training don't receive more than 10 hours of communication training. Those 10 hours are not all de-escalation. And again, that's an average across the nation, so each uh, region can change. Uh, but to say that if folks are behaving aggressively, we want to be able to respond uh, accordingly with de-escalation. Mm -hmm. The next one is people with bipolar disorder are constantly swinging between happy and sad. True, false, or in between? False. Seeing a few falls come through. Ooh, maybe we're stumped on this one. False. If people are taking some time and thinking it depends. That is fair sometimes. True, false. Depends. All right. So I see we're somewhere in between sometimes and depends. Uh, and so some of this, so for the, for the purposes of the, this work, it is false. Um, bipolar is a very impactful illness, but it's more than just swinging back and forth between like really happy times and really sad times. People who are diagnosed with bipolar uh, can have periods of depression. They can have periods of being really excited, also known as a period of mania, or they can have a long period of baseline moods outside of something that would be perceived as mania or depression. It really depends on the person. So for example, I can have a number of emotions throughout my day, right? I can start my morning and be super excited because I had some delicious coffee and I had a wonderful meditation and I'm really excited and happy in the morning. And then I could turn and read the newspaper and hear about some atrocity that has happened that can make me really sad. And then in the afternoon, I could um, be happy again, right? So that's a normal mood swing based on environmental factors. And so like I talked about earlier, we want to move away from calling something or somebody a behavior bipolar, when in fact, that is an actual diagnosis, and it moves far beyond just the swinging between one mood to another. I promise there are some statements that are meant to be true. All of these seem false so far, um, but I appreciate all those in-betweens. So for this next one, uh, psychosis is not a diagnosable mental illness. Psychosis is not a diagnosable mental illness. True or false? I see true, Megan. And we're silent in the chat. Is this uh, just stumped? I see a second true. A true and a false. So a lot of true, one false so far. Uh, so this one is true. Uh, psychosis is not a diagnosable, diagnosable mental illness because psychosis is actually just a cluster of signs and symptoms. So individuals could be experiencing psychosis uh, despite uh, a diagnosis. They could have a diagnosis that is associated with experiences of psychosis. And psychosis is most often uh, recognized as the disconnection from shared reality. So that's when we think about hallucinations or delusions. So hallucinations being input to our five senses that no one else is responding to. So smells, things that we hear, sounds, things that we taste, smell, or feel on our skin that only we do uh, and nobody else does, uh, that being a hallucination. Or a delusion being just beliefs and ideas that are only true to me and not rooted in the shared reality that most of us uh, are, are participating in. So those signs and symptoms are often uh, labeled as psychosis, uh, and psychosis is not a permanent condition. Uh, so once individuals go into psychosis, it is uh, very, very, very unlikely that individuals will constantly live in psychosis. In fact, a third of individuals experience psychosis only once in their life, Another third experiences uh, psychosis in an ongoing basis, but with true baseline and well-being in between those episodes. And the last third, which is often the most severe 
uh, conditions, they do spend a lot of time in psychosis, but there we, for what we know, we can observe moments when they come back to shared reality. Um, so psychosis is not a diagno diagnosable mental illness, and it is also not a permanent condition. Mm -hmm. The next prompt is people who self-harm don't really want to kill themselves. True, false, or in between? I see a true, a few trues. Give it, give it 10 more seconds. All right. Um, and we agree. Absolutely, it is true. And so many of us, when we think of self-harm, we think about the non-suicidal self-injury, our NSSI, uh, and it goes beyond cutting. A lot of us think of cutting and the teenager who is doing this particular type of self-harm, but uh, there are plenty of other things that qualify as uh, self-harm. It could be excessive exercise. Do you know people who like run all the time and, and really like um, to the point of exhaustion. It could be mixing medication, alcohol use, a non-fatal overdose, risky behavior and thrill-seeking behaviors, and plenty more. There are lots of other activities that could be qualified as um, uh, non-suicidal self-injury. So absolutely true. It is a risk factor for future suicide, and that's something to keep in mind. But we generally don't ask someone to stop engaging in this behavior, but rather we explore harm reduction models and alternatives and try to figure out um, what's going on with them that's driving these types of behaviors. Our last statement, uh, suicide happens without warning. True or false? Suicide happens without warning. I see it depends. I see a false. Just a few more seconds. Suicide happens without warning. True or false? unseen, could be unseen warnings. That's a really good detail. Mm -hmm. So we, we believe this to be false. Um, I see that the true false, so a lot of in-betweens. Uh, as most things related to human beings, it is somewhere in between. It, it is a little bit more complicated than absolutely true or absolutely false. But overwhelmingly, this is false. Uh, in fact, some studies show that eight or nine out of 10 suicides do present clear, visible warning signs. We may not always have the best information to be able to recognize them as warning signs. And so in hindsight, in 2020, we can say, oh, yes, I can recognize that as, as a warning sign. Um, so many times it's more about us not recognizing them, us not seeing them. Uh, but that's where conversations like this come in. So how do we start having better information so we can identify them? Um, we know that typically things to look out for is if individuals start having a plan for their suicide, if they start talking about how they would go about putting a plan into action, if they have a past suicide attempt, we know that folks have increased risk for about four months after any, any attempt. Um, there's also a concept that is often talked about as suicide contagion, where individuals are likely to be an increased risk of dying by suicide if someone close to them or someone that they're connected to dies by suicide. For example, when Robin Williams uh, died by suicide, uh, the crisis line saw an uptick, a spike in calls of individuals in crisis. And a lot of that was attributed to the connection that Robin Williams had with his audiences and how individuals who were severely impacted by it themselves went into a lot of risk uh, of potentially thinking, considering and attempting suicide. Um, we also want to use this opportunity to address the myth that people who talk about suicide don't really want to kill themselves or individuals who often talk about and play about the, the possibility of dying, they're not really uh, thinking of suicide. Uh, we do know that especially working with young people, they talk about dying frequently. It is a reaction where, you know, so-and-so happened and I died. 
or I don't want to do this assignment, I'd rather be dead. And we know that's something that's very frequent to hear with young people. Uh, what we want to start doing is responding to every mention of death and suicide with a serious follow-up just to assess where is this coming from. Because we do know that there are many folks who talk about their own death as a temperature check to see how individuals would respond to their death. And so if you hear it, uh, we would encourage you to consider being that person that is too sensitive to talk about suicide, where if someone mentions uh, suicide, they know that Ivan will always follow up and respond, or Joy will always follow up in a text and say, hey, you mentioned that, just wanted to check in. Uh, we invite you to consider to become that person, because unfortunately, there are a lot of individuals who talk about suicide in a way that seems playful or like a joke, um, and at some point, it might not be a joke, it might be that temperature check to see how will people uh, around me respond. Um, and lastly, one of the things we want to highlight here is language. The way we speak about suicide can really impact individuals who are going through through difficult time. So one of the things that we're asking you to, to update is instead of saying that someone committed suicide, is to say that someone completed suicide or someone died by suicide. The reason for this, the logic behind it, is that the word commit has a lot of cultural weight. If we think of the things that people commit in, in daily life, it is often negative. It is committing a crime, committing a violation. If you're in a, a faith-based space, you commit sin. And we really know that individuals who are experiencing uh, suicidal crises or thoughts of suicide, uh, it is often one of their best attempts to, to prevent more suffering, to stop the pain. And that's already heavy enough to add the weight of committing suicide can further criminalize a behavior that is actually just an indication that someone is going through a really hard time. So we encourage you in, in your materials, in your daily conversations, whenever it comes up, to talk about, if you do need to talk about someone who died by suicide, to use that language, someone completed suicide or someone died by suicide. Um, so that is all of the, the statements in this true or false activity, depending on your own lived experience, this conversation can be heavy. You might notice your breathing is different. Your chest might feel a little bit tight. So we're going to do three collective breaths. I'm going to ask that we breathe in through our nose for three, hold for four, and breathe out through your mouth for five. And we're going to do that three times together. If you want to pass, that's also perfectly fine. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to breathe in and hold and breathe out. Again, breathe in. Hold and breathe out. Last time, breathe in. Hold and breathe out. Thank you for, for participating in that true false activity. I could see that many of you have good information, which I would say. Uh, put you in a very good position to be able to lead these type of interactions with your own community in the facilitation guide that we send with you. All of the explanation that Joy and I just uh, went through are also in there. So if you feel like, oh, I did not know many of those things, uh, they're also part of the facilitation guide. Um, before we start wrapping up, uh, the last conversation that we're going to, to use from this curriculum is to highlight the difference between being helpful and being supportive. Because part, going back to the purpose of, of these conversations, of building community, of exploring uh, mental health and community, is recognizing that many of us want to help. Uh, but it turns out that many of us are not in the position to help, but we're in the best position to support. So uh, I'd like to ask one of you to just go off mic and, and talk about the difference between help and support. Or if you're a devil's advocate, feel free to tell us that they're actually the exact same thing and I'm talking just air. I think help is actually setting up a plan with goals that they're to reach and actually setting them up with resources and making sure they follow through, um, helping them overcome the issue. I think support is just basically being there, motivating them, 
telling them that things are going to get better, telling them if they need someone to talk to, you're there. I look at that as more of support. I, th I think you hit it right on the nose. Uh, so so uh, help. So I'd like to, to think of two different points, right? So you have the person experiencing a crisis on one end, and then you have us, external support on the other end. Help is when this external support comes in and tells you, this is what you need to do. Here are treatments, here are, if appropriate, medications, here are tapping techniques, let's make a plan. So that help is external coming in to say, this is what you need to do to, to make things better. This requires a lot of training. It requires a lot of preparation to be culturally responsive, to be appropriate, and to be updated. It turns out that uh, diagnosing is really hard. So to be able to help, it just requires a lot of preparation. So if you are a clinician, if you are trained, if you're a mental health first aider, you're maybe in a better position to help. But if we're not any of those things, which is true for most of us, then we're in the ideal position to support, which is the difference of doing things for to doing things with. And so these conversations are really to encourage all of us, regardless of academic background, of professional qualifications, that all of us can be supportive. And as you say, we can all be there and say, I am here for you. I am here with you. What can I do? What would be helpful? Um, so these conversations really close in. There's a couple of activities after the true uh, false myth busing activity to really help individuals think, uh, what does it look like when I'm trying to help, but I should be supporting? Um, so all of that is in the curriculum, but I'm going to ask us for us to stop here so we can go into questions. And we're going to do two rounds of questions. One is going to be what questions do you have about the content? Is there anything that we've said that you would like to clarify for us to go back on and expand further? That's going to be round one. Round two is around facilitation. What questions do you have about taking this conversation to your community? So we're going to start with round one of questions. Uh, what questions do you have about the content? It would be great if I get a crickets sound just so that in these moments I could have crickets playing and it's not super awkward. I agree. <laughs> uh, if none, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, are there any questions around the facilitation around bringing this to, to your own uh, communities with your own teams? How would you recommend approaching families and volunteers with this material um, I'm just thinking we do have a lot of people that would benefit from this, but aren't necessarily help seeking where they're going to ask for resources and show up to these type of events. Yeah, that's a good question. What, what I've experienced and what has been successful for, for me in the past um, is by having it as an open offer and encouraging folks to, to also help out in the, the outreach. So for example, I've worked with parishes, so faith-based settings and also other teams and organizations that they're interested because they know that there's that need in their community. Um, and so we come in and they already have that interest. So it does, if it's more volunteer rather than, than forced as you have to take this training. So the way that I would um, use that in your communities is by having that uh, option open in a recurring basis. So having a community conversation every quarter and so folks know that they maybe want to go, but they don't feel ready. So they won't go this one. They'll go to the next quarterly uh, community conversation. The second thing that I would recommend is uh, what else is surrounding these conversations? I would always encourage coffee, alternative to coffee, and some snacks. Um, not necessarily to bribe people to come into this, this conversation, but because we know that food tends to warm things up in a way that is a little bit more inviting, a little less threatening. So I would do a lot of those extra things that you already do um, to, to incorporate them into these. Thank you. I would also recommend um, including it into your pre-match training. So we don't know yet the full impact of the last couple of years on our youth and their mental wellness. Um, but we do want to be sure that our mentors have some comfortability with noticing things and feeling empowered to at least talk 
um, to a certain extent, at least with you, are the match support coordinators, or with caregivers. And so this could be kind of an introduction to mental health um, as part of your pre-match training. Our conversations with caregivers as well. Any other questions? Okay. Well, as they come up, as you all, um, when you receive the materials, if you have some, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to share some additional information. A couple of things coming up. We are coming to a close of our time together, our formal time together. I do hope that we remain connected after May. Um, but we, uh, as you know, we had been at a every other month kind of meeting schedule. And we're changing that up a bit so that we can prepare for a cohort closure. So we will not meet as a group in March, but we will meet April 14th and May 10th, the first in April to prepare for cohort closure and the second in May to uh, actually have a conversation about closure and also some reflection and celebration and looking back at the time we spent together. It really has been amazing to walk alongside you all um, during one of the most difficult times in recent American history. So I uh, don't take it lightly that our formal time is closing, but again, I look forward to us maintaining connection after May. So uh, you can look for these dates to be on the website to register for soon, but I wanted to share them with you so that you can be sure to save the dates on your calendar. So, and with that, go ahead. I was going to say thank you for joining us today. We have done a lot in the last 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your reflections on the work that you have done this past month, uh, specifically around uh, National Mentoring Month and National uh, Mentoring Summit. And thank you for participating in that modified version of a community conversation, very much believing that uh, modeling is a way that, that we can continue to do this work. Thank you for participating. Uh, and uh, we wish you the best of luck as you invite your own communities to also participate in, in these conversations. Uh, with that, thank you so much. And there's four extra minutes of your day now. Oh, before you go to enjoy the rest of your day, please uh, do us a solid and complete the evaluation. We use this information to help inform how we do our presentation. So please, um, Benina, thank you for dropping that link in the chat. If you all could be sure to complete that evaluation.